We hope you enjoy the following video presentation sponsored by the C.S. Lewis Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to equip and encourage Christians to live their faith within the world of ideas and arts. To help us continue to host events and make videos like this one, please make a donation after viewing the video by going to www.cslewis.org or clicking the link below. Thank you. He holds the PhD from, from Stanford University. He was professor of psychology at New York University for many, many years. He is currently senior scholar and professor at the Institute for Psychological Sciences. IPS is a Catholic graduate school of psychology offering both master's and doctoral programs of study in which the scientific study of psychology is based upon and rooted in Catholic understanding of the person, marriage, and the family. Dr. Vitz is the author of numerous books and articles exploring the dimensions of personality theory and the structure of contemporary notions of the self, the psychological factors that contribute to the formation of worldview assumptions and the contribution of patristic and Thomistic theological insights to a consistent and biblically informed Christian understanding of the person ties directly into the meditation that Malcolm gave us this morning, rooted in St. Paul. Central to these concerns is the careful analysis of the role of family, and especially the father, in the rise and shape of modern atheism. Dr. Vitz will now come as he speaks on how psychology supports a Catholic Christian meta model of a person and vice versa. Join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Vitz. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you, C.S. Lewis Institute, and um, for, and Stan, for inviting me and giving me the privilege of speaking to such a distinguished audience as we have here today. My talk will not be nearly as well organized, as lucid, and probably significant as Professor Wolterstorff's. It won't be as um, uh, truly inspiring as uh, Reverend Malcolm, but it will be an attempt at answering some of the questions that were raised in both of those speakers' presentations. In particular, I want to propose for you a model of the person relevant in the general sense to our understanding of the person and with special relevance to application in psychology and psychotherapy. This model will be an example, I hope, of the kind of way of addressing the public square that Professor Walter Storff said we should do. Let me first say a few words about the model itself in terms of its history. The model is the result of a group effort. The small faculty at IPS for many years, in fact starting maybe 15 years ago, began working on this model. And so we would meet once a month as a faculty for over these many years, constructing the model. The faculty had a variety of different disciplines represented. We had philosophers, theologians, general psychologists, and particular psychologists who might be, say, trained in something like family therapy or the psychoanalytic tradition or things of that kind. And so over the years, this has been developed. So it's a serious proposal. I would like, however, to point out that today I have to sort of combine two papers, the general philosophical premises of the model, with my own psychological evidence for support. So things will be a little bit disjointed. But I hope to be clear about what we're attempting to do.
First of all, we call this a Catholic Christian meta model. Now, the terms Catholic and Christian are fairly clear. I'll go into that in more detail later. But why a meta model? The reason we use that term is that it is not just another model of person and personality in the same way that psychology already has perhaps a half a dozen major such models. This is not a model of personality in the sense that uh, Freud provided one or the contemporary psychoanalytic approach has one. It's not a model in the sense of Adler or Jung or humanistic psychology and so on. In fact, it's a model that is conceptually in many ways um, above them. Not in any negative sense of being above, but some, it's a structure in which we believe we can incorporate the important and the major contributions that come from each of those approaches. So in general, it is very friendly to the psychological discoveries, whatever they might be and from whatever framework, that are now well established and have been found both conceptually valid and empirically uh, useful in therapy and in other domains. And we are, in retrospect now, very grateful for the contributions from these psychologists, almost all of whom were secular. And so this represents something of a change in my attitude towards psychology. For those who might have known you, known me, and known my initial approach to psychology, which was very critical, particularly of some of the humanistic psychologists. I stand by the particular criticisms, but I certainly acknowledge that they made important positive contributions, and so did many of the other theorists. So we are welcoming most psychology, psychologies into the general framework of the meta model, at least those parts which have been shown to be valid and empirically demonstrated. We don't welcome many of the personal assumptions and worldviews that went with these psychologists, but of course those in fact weren't really related to the actual validity of the contributions that they made. So that's why we call it a meta model, because it is one that is a general framework. And another reason for calling it a meta model is that we have three major uh, levels of understanding of the person combined in the model. We have a theological level, a philosophical level, and a psychological level. All three are treated as independent, but yet as mutually capable of supporting each other. Now, the model consists of essentially 11 premises or 11 uh, characteristics of the person. Each of these characteristics has a defense at a philosophical, and of course theological, and psychological level. So, I now move to what some of those, we'll go, I'll, let, I'll mention all the premises, and I will focus on three of them in particular. The first three premises of the model are that the person is created by God in the image of God. The second premise is that we are fallen. Part of the first premise is, of course, that we were created good. That, was a good, that when God created us, it was something good. And the second premise is that we are fallen, that due to disobedience and sin, we've got real problems. And the third premise is that we are redeemed through Christ. Now what I have to do is to show how those things might relate to psychology in a way that has uh, a structural analogy. And I'll spend most of my time this morning on those three. But here are the remaining eight premises. The fourth premise 
is that we all have a vocation, a calling. From our perspective of the model, it's from God. But even the secularists see people as having a, a, a calling or a desire, a profession as a kind of calling. But we propose that there are three callings that everybody has. One is a personal calling. Uh, for a Christian, we are all called to holiness. For a secularist, we might all be called to self-actualization. We also are called to a state in life. No, commonly, that's to be the married state. But we might be called to the single life or some kind of consecrated life as well. And the third state is that we are all called to some kind of work or occupation which benefits those around us and our community. This occupation or work may not be necessarily paid. We certainly include people who aren't paid for their occupation. We believe that all people are called to vocations and we believe this should be seen as an important part of addressing a patient or client in psychotherapy. A second a new contribution here, are, let's see, where are we? We're at number five now. The fifth premise is that we are called to work out our state through the development of the virtues. The virtues are seen along with their development and along with our call to vocation as the essence of human flourishing. Now what this means is that we've introduced in a major way, in two separate connect ways, vocation and virtues, a future-oriented uh, approach to understanding the person in terms of psychotherapy. Where they are headed, their telos, is one of the important things that needs to be evaluated. The sixth through the eleventh properties of the person that we describe are what you would call structural properties of the person. They are not the narrative theological components. They are not the teleological um, flourishing components of vocation and virtue. They are what we propose as the major structural characteristics of a person. The first of these is that the person is a whole and is a unity of body and soul. This implies that our unity uh, of body and soul means that our body, for example, is important. We are embodied and that needs to be evaluated in understanding the person, but also we are a whole. Then we go on to describe the characteristic domains or prom uh, premises that describe the dimensions of the person. The first that we propose is that the person is interpersonal. Unlike psychologies that might emphasize the autonomous indivi individual, the isolated individual, we propose that the person in many and large respects comes into existence through their relationships with others. Not just the relationship that they start with in their family, but the relationships with when as an adult they begin to have more freedom in choosing who they will have a relationship with. But this interpersonal way of creating the person we believe is intrinsic to uh, the nature of the person. You can obviously see it mirrored in the Trinity if you're thinking theologically. But those psychologies that concentrate exclusively on the isolated individual, we feel, are not so much wrong as terribly limited by neglecting this. So the first structural property is we're interpersonal, we're called to relationship. Uh, of course, we're called to relationship with God and with others in general, but. First, we're just saying we're called to relationship. Then we have four other properties of the person. The person has reason and intelligence. The person has 
sensory, perceptual, and imaginative characteristics. That's another one. So there we have reason and imagination as two of the major components. We have uh, two others. We have emotion or feeling as a major independent dimension of the person. And it's out of emotion in many times that a lot of the meaning of life comes along with imagination. And finally, we come to the will, which we propose as a very central d dimension of the person. And that will is at least uh, significantly free in the adult. Not completely free, but significantly so. And that that will is central to understanding a person's psychology. So I've sketched out then the 11 premises of the model. And as you can see, under such general premises, many of the existing theories of psychology fit with limitations, of course. The limitations are usually things which they did not address, which they ignored. They may have ignored interpersonal relationships. They may have ignored reason. They may have ignored emotion and so forth. But what they did contribute, we allow in its own form to be present underneath this kind of conceptual umbrella. Now let me address some of the ways in which the model explicitly either agrees with or challenges the secular world in, I hope, is language that they can understand of their own language and to show that what we are doing or proposing at any rate, is not um, a weird, isolated irrelevancy as far as the academic intellectual community is concerned. And so now I go back to um, the first three premises, which are theological. And they are that we are created by God in the image of God. And that when God created us, male and female, he created us. He created us and it was good. Now from this, we draw the conclusion that all human beings are made in the image of God. And therefore, all human beings are of equal dignity and moral worth. Now, as far as I know, no other uh, approach to psychology has a rationale for why the patient or client should be treated, if you will, as valuable to be treated benevolently. Many good secular psychologists have something of this kind of assumption about, about the person. They're humanistically uh, open to the value of people. But let me point out that that assumption itself is not necessarily found in all of psychology or in all of philosophy either. Uh, there are uh, psychologists now talking very strongly about the evolutionary history of the human being and talking about the human being as an accident of both chance and survival. And as such, there is no basis in an evolutionary approach to the person to understand why the human being is so intrinsically valuable and why they have dignity, even if they're mentally defective, even if they're uh, with Alzheimer's, whatever the condition, uh, why are they of value? One of the reasons they have value, of course, is not just that they have value in themselves, but these conditions that I've just mentioned help us. They give, they interact with us. They are in a relationship with us. And in that relationship, they are telling us something that we need to know about life and people and love and humanity itself. Many of the people who say they, they think an, Alzheimer's patients should be uh, euthanized, uh, don't understand that the relationship between the Alzheimer's person and those around them is part of who they are and is part of who the people who help them are and is therefore of value.
so we can imagine people in the future maybe dropping the idea that people of certain types and kinds are not of universal worth. So we have a firm grounding on that, and so that all people should be met with dignity and respect as created in the image of God. And in general, I think what we're trying to do with this is to say to the secular psychologists, please explain the rationale for why you think people are valuable and should be helped in psychotherapy. Many would say, well, as a humanistic psychologist, I have this position as an initial assumption, and so on. That's fine. But they need to spell it out. Because there are people today, not just uh, people arguing for the uh, three-year-old chimpanzee being more valuable than a one-year-old human infant because of the intellectual maturity difference. There are people arguing, as I mentioned in our session yesterday, there are people arguing that the human being itself should be made extinct. There are people arguing today that artificial intelligence should supersede humanity and there should be a great singularity in which this new artificial intelligence comes into existence and human beings should be shunted aside. More or less like, we, like the great apes are shunted aside. So we wish to ask the general community academia and the intellectual lie. Tell us your initial foundations for what, where did we come from? How do we get our value? Now our second uh, understanding is that the person is fallen. Now I think it, one of the things that psychotherapy and psychologists have done, and which is really a, a, a wonderful contribution in scripture it says there were people who had eyes and did not see and ears and did not hear. Okay, that was an observation, but psychologists have identified a lot of the unconscious or semi-conscious mechanisms that are involved in people's, in quotes, denial of the reality in front of them. And they've developed an understanding of, say, defense mechanisms and things of that kind. They've developed an understanding of the pathologies, the experiences that cause traumas in childhood. They have, in fact, in developed a massive understanding of a lot of the natural interior life. And this has been done by psychologists. As I said, a good number of them were just plain secularists, and a fair number of them were almost obnoxiously aggressive atheists. So God just had patience with them, and they did something that we wouldn't have done anyway, and made a major contribution. So I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said something to the effect, I don't think this is a quote, but that the, the Christian understanding of the sinful nature of man is about the only Christian doctrine which has uh, almost an you know, a, a massive piece of, a, a massive amount of evidence to support it. All we have to do is look at the violence and the hatreds and the narcissism and the, uh, all the different things going on out there. Out there. <laughs> of course it's out there, isn't it? Anyway, it, it snuck in the room when we weren't looking to. Um, and so the fallenness is almost the starting place for all secular psychologists. They don't call it fallenness, they don't call it original sin or sin. But in fact, that's the problem they're addressing. So they all, we all can agree with them, not only that we have a big problem, that this is what psychologists concentrate on trying to deal with, but we can thank them for their ability to have spelled out in much more detail what sin consists of the ways in which it exists, the way in which evil is done to people that causes them to become, uh, in a certain sense, evil themselves. What are those traumas and pathologies and so on? So we can thank them for that. And then the third thing is that we are redeemed. Now this is a, a major theological claim, of course. We are redeemed by Christ. 
Now that aspect is part of the theological level of the model. But redemption in Christ is not part of our psychological model, even in the Catholic Christian tradition. Redemption is not psychological. Redemption is grace. It's a theological answer. So from the point of view of a Christian psychology, our position is to prepare the student, prepare the friend, prepare the patient, prepare the client for their redemption. That means to make straight the way for the Lord. But that doesn't mean redemption is something the therapist provides. That would be a violation of the therapeutic alliance and of, in many ways, professional ethics because you have a kind of power and influence with respect to the client that must be uh, respected and their free will needs to be respected. So the psychologist's job is to bring freedom to the patient by, if you will, unlocking the prison doors of their mental uh, pathologies. You visit them in their sickness. You visit them and help them escape from the prisons of, of narcissism or hatred or um, uh, depression or anger. And that's where you leave it. Now, not all secular psychologists leave it there. And this is the thing that's interesting. In, they put in a form of redemption into their theories. They don't call it redemption, except recently a few have used that term. But let me point out to you that most of us are familiar with, let's say, the humanistic model of psychology, uh, particularly as developed by uh, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. Rogers assumed that we were all made basically good. There was no problem of sin. Our problems came from other people, our parents, our siblings, the society, our religion. And we had to disinhibit ourselves from those, from those um, uh, negative experiences and those negative effects. Of course, they never discussed how a species of innately all good creatures ever created a society in which bad things could happen. But we won't, you know, that wasn't to be addressed. So, but he did say, in contrast to the Christian position, well, well, that we had no natural tendency or capacity to harm ourselves or others, to be sinful. And he then proposed that when you went through his form of psychotherapy, the answer, which is the answer to life, and he said this is not only the answer to life for the patients I see, this is the answer for life for people in general, for society. And he said the answer to life, that is our redeeming uh, state, would be called and known as self actualization. So he clearly proposed a kind of redemption. Uh, another example of that, which is quite interesting, a little bit of a tangent, but most of you have heard of the psychology of Carl Jung. Well, Jung, uh, he didn't say too much about our origin. He did say we were born with innate structures in the collective unconscious. And these, the basic kinds of structures, he called them archetypes. And Jungian therapy was to get the individual in touch with their archetypes and to express them and evaluate them in a process called self-realization. And explicitly, his students claimed that self-realization was a form of spiritual salvation explicitly. So it isn't as though uh, the answer to life with some sort of fulfillment isn't found in many a secular theory. So that although we propose one, which is redemption, we also take that redemption 
out of being something actively pushed by the therapist. We do not assume to tell the, ther the, the patient what fulfillment, what redemption they should choose. Our job is to open their freedom so that then redemption is their choice. But other psychologists have not been so kind about saying what should be the answer to your life. And I will read what Sigmund Freud said about such psychologists, because there were two of them at the time Freud was alive. One was Jung, and the other was Alfred Adler, for whom I have a lot of respect in many ways. And so they come to us in the middle of stage two and in the middle of their problems, and we hope to prepare them for the third stage. Now, to have such a narrative was originally considered very anti-scientific in psychology. But psychology has wised up to the importance of narratives. I think they've gotten a lot of it from various philosophically oriented theologians, the importance of narrative. But in any way, today, narrative approaches to, to solving the person's problems in psychotherapy are extremely common and advocated by major traditional secular psychologists. One, McLeod, uh, an Englishman, has said that all psychotherapy is narrative. Another one has recently answered, McAdams has recently said, we need to get the stories for each person's life, and most of all, and he said this explicitly now, we need redemptive stories. So there is nothing radically different in a narrative approach in our model as compared to many other forms of psychology. Um, a number of psychoanalysts have introduced the narrative approach to psychoanalysis, pointing out that in many respects Freud's own case history is read better as short stories than as scientific treatises. And Freud was of course famous for his German style, which was apparently quite good, and um, for which he got the Goethe Prize. <laughs> he never got the Nobel Prize, essentially a prize for literature. And of course, his theories were a mixture of abstract science and literature, such as the Oedipus complex and so forth. So I think we've, uh, shown that when we say we have this general narrative with these three stages, that although it is clearly different from existing approaches, it challenges the existing approaches to be clearer about where their narrative and redemption uh, comes from. And um, it acknowledges and accepts in particular the many ways in which psychology has contributed to what we would call our fallenness. And that it is in a narrative framework in which the particular narrative of the person is a subcategory of it. Not everybody, you know, everybody will follow their own, uh, as we all know, particular narrative to escape, let's say, whatever their problems might be. Now I want to say a little bit more about the, the a little bit more about the theology of these three uh, approaches, these three uh, premises. As far as I know, this theological understanding is basic Christianity. We call it a Catholic Christian approach. So I don't, maybe there's something that's Catholic about it. I'm not sure. I'm sure if there is, you'll get me on it. That's fine. But I think it's a kind of mere Christianity at this level that we discuss it. So a little bit more is that the person, humans are created by God in the image of God and after the likeness of God. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. They are good as in everything created by God and have special dignity and value as persons. Also, there is the gift of love, 
Their lives and every good thing are ultimately a gift of love that has been given and is continually sustained by God. In turn, acceptance of the gift, gratitude, worship, service, and self-gift, self-gift in love to others, are appropriate responses to the original gift. There are some more properties that are spelled out under created. I have copies of that paper back there. Um, this, this is really done by our present in-house theologian philosopher, um, Dr. Craig Titus. But uh, for those who want to see the specifics, um, maybe there you'll, 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 you'll find something that's sort of Catholic or not. Um, we, I now go to fallen, how, we, how it's defined, and this is theologically and in a sense um, almost philosophically. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the divine likeness in mankind is wounded and disfigured. And this leads to disorder and trials, that is the experience of sin, weakness, decay, death, and disorder constitute the difficulties and trials experienced in human temporal life. Original sin and the consequences of every personal and every other sin pit mankind against God, each human person against himself, person against person, and mankind against nature. These have scriptural references. I, goodness is foundational and evil is not. The tendency toward evil is a disordering of inclinations that are themselves basically good. While the wounds of evil are now foundational, the enduring goodness of God's creation uh, is where sin increased, grace abounds. The goodness of God's creation is where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Our struggle with evil and sin put human flourishing in peril. Evil is a disordered a disordering and privation of what should be, according to human nature, created in the image of God. Emotions such as hatred, thoughts such as lies, choices such as suicide, commitments such as adultery instead of fidelity, or development in adulthood expressing immature levels of responsibility. Evil opposes God through disobedience to the law of love, demonic obsessions, and spiritual opposition. So that's the discussion of our fallenness in this model. And we are redeemed through Jesus Christ's incarnation. Um, and so we say to the secularist, tell us where all this evil comes from. Can you give us more about it? You've been beautifully informative at describing them. You can often talk about the, the traumas that cause them. But what is the source of those traumas in the people that cause them? And here we have an answer. You know, those to whom evil is done do evil in return, and this evilness in response to evil is a commonplace. And we are called in response to evil to return evil with good, to re return hatred with love, to break that natural, apparently fairly natural, inevitable cycle. All right, now I'm going to look at, at least briefly, some of the other aspects of the model. And these include, uh, first, vocation. And the importance of bringing vocation and, as I've said, virtues into the understanding of the person and into psychotherapy is to bring the future in, to bring flourishing in. Not just, what's your problem and how can we solve it? But where are you trying to go in life? How can we help you choose? How can you go to flourishing? One of the things we're doing at IPS, which is open to any psychological uh, school, is we're introdu introducing virtues as possible, that is, particular virtues can be targeted for particular pathologies. 
And, these, and the learning of these virtues can be introduced into the therapy sessions. And let me explain. Cognitive and behavioral therapy for 30 or more years has laid the ground for the psychotherapeutic sessions to be sessions in which you try to change how people thought to make their thinking less pathological, less extreme, less, unre less uh, unrealistic. And in doing that, they often gave the patient homework, things to practice outside of the therapy session. Well, now we're proposing that it might be useful to, 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 to address a particular pathology in the patient with a particular virtue. And so you would give them, uh, I'll give you some examples. These right now have been written in the form of dissertations. They are theoretical because to do the research is going to be uh, time consuming and difficult and the IPS doesn't have a large group of patients who would be willing to be in experiments and so forth. So there are all sorts of ethical questions called here. But eventually, these things are quite possible. <coughs> For example, one person has proposed that you could take moderate ruminative depression, people who are moderately depressed, and seem to obsessively think about these depressing things. And you could target that a pathology, or in the older language, vice. You could target it with the virtue of gratitude, in which you had them write letters to people they were grateful for, make lists of things that had helped them throughout their life, and to, in essence, switch their attention from one themselves and two these these terrible things in their life that they're always obsessing about, that they don't have, or that they were hurt by. So that would, so you would target them with gratitude as an answer. Another possible uh, example, let's say you have a narcissistic personality. The biggest problem with the narcissist is they can never, again, get outside of themselves. They're always looking for a confirmation about how wonderful they are. Um, one of our students did a dissertation targeting two virtues uh, for the narcissist. And this meant stages of, you know, the early stages of how to develop, address it, and then middle stages, and so on. Theory. But it's coming. Something like this is going to emerge. Um, it suggested that one of the virtues that the narcissist needs is humility. But you're not going to get the narcissist to say, <laughs> to buy that. Narcissists don't like the very term. So you don't call it humility, you call it self-knowledge. Genuine self-knowledge. Now that, I, I thought when that was developed, it might not be adequate for the narcissist. And so I suggested a second virtue which should help them. And that's the virtue of altruism. Why? You could ask the, the patient to do an altruistic act per day, write it down for homework, and bring it back and tell you who, who the per what you did and to whom. And the thing that it does to the narcissist is it gets them outside of themselves to think about the other person. What is it that they would like? What would they want? What would be good for that person? That's my task. I have to do it. And when they do it, they begin to develop the virtue because virtues are performing acts. They're not ideas. They're not concepts. And so they begin to develop it. And maybe for the first time in their life, they'll get a compliment that they didn't fish for, one that was actually genuinely given to them. Thank you so much for doing that for me. I didn't expect anyone would, and you did it, it's so nice. It'd be something of, a, of an insight. At any rate, so we're working on the virtues, on talking about vocation as part of the therapeutic practice. I think I'm getting near the end of time, aren't I? Am I over yet? I'm about there? Okay. 
Um, our interest in interpersonal psychology, and by the way, the autonomous individual of 50 years ago has now been substantially corrected by psychologists talking about interpersonal uh, psychotherapy and talking about emotionally focused therapy and so on. So that's great. Um, but we have a special focus because we argue that in the abstract, in the, the basic purpose of life is to love God and to love others. And so the notion of self-gift to the other is one of the things we propose as another form of homework, if you will. And this doesn't have to be religious, you see. You ask this person to do, to give of them their time or their treasure or whatever they have to another. And, we be, and so that it, as being loving toward those around you, which ought to be a pretty reliable sign of Christians anyway, uh, we're now proposing as a general uh, kind of potential homework uh, in the framework of uh, contemporary cognitive behavioral therapeutic approaches. So in conclusion, we're, we're making this general model, we're calling it a meta model. The Catholic component is primarily at the philosophical level and here I would say the philosophy, that the, the philosophers at that level, uh, I'm no philosopher, so I can't tell you about it with any precision, but I can say that the philosophy that they're using is a mixture of both uh, Thomism, a lot of Thomism, but also a, a fair amount of what has been called Catholic personalist philosophy. This is the kind of uh, philosophy, much of it found in some of the writings of John Paul II, but which goes all the way back to Gabriel Marcel and uh, Meunier, uh, Negoncel, and others. There's a whole tradition of that, which is more phenomenological in its uh, character. Also, uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand is one of the major uh, people that we're looking at uh, in, at the philosophical level. Um, we can steal him, we could steal, we steal sometimes uh, Martin Buber too, <laughs> uh, and that type of thinking. But the notion of relationship is so central, and the idea of love of God and others being part and being at the core of that relationship, and self-gift being a way to describe what love is uh, with, in the positive sense between people. But it might be at the philosophical level that uh, many of you would have uh, serious uh, ex exceptions to bring up or differences, so be it. But we don't think that this model is the end all or be all. We're still working on it. We hope to have it finished and available publicly in a published sense in about a year. But it's taken 15 years, so we'll have to show more patience to finally get it done anyway. And we hope it challenges the secularists to a more global understanding of their understanding of person. Uh, we don't say that that'll be the same. I expect there could be a, possibly a, um, uh, 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 let's say a, a Jewish model of the person. Most of our understanding of the person here, and a lot of it anyway, is taken from the Old Testament, from Genesis anyway. but. Um, there could be other approaches. Somebody might take uh, Albert Ellis, uh, who was kind of a very aggressive atheist, but very much appreciated by many um, Christians. There's a sort of interesting story about Ellis. You know, he was very aggressively atheist. He made all kinds of n nasty comments about religion. Um, he was a real tough, street educated, brilliant New York Jew, secular. But the people who began to like it, he, gave, he had an institute where he would train people in cognitive and behavioral therapy under his model. And he was surprised that so many uh, Christians signed up. 
In fact, dozens, I think, of Baptist ministers would come and take his courses. And he would make, they would have to live through, you know, they'd, they wouldn't say anything, and live through his scurrilous attacks on religion, which were sort of asides. But what happened, they were so interested in positive because at last, particularly in the 70s and 80s, when it was much more new and innovative, that somebody had brought in reason to the understanding of psychotherapy, that it wasn't all unconscious, it wasn't all uh, feely-weely, uh, goody-woody, and all of that stuff. It wasn't archetypes and strange things like that. You could use reason and correct your thinking. And so one of the long-term effects of so many Christians who took Ellis's course was after a while, he began to have some tolerance of them and slightly less aggressively, uh, you know, talked about them in his talks. But he was really quite uh, nasty. But it was he was he, he came to respect through his great uh, intelligence and diligence and learning capacity of these Christian often ministers who came and said, look, you, you have that worldview, but what you're really saying is great stuff. Thank you. And so today I think psychology is ready for a, a Christian model as a challenge. This model would be only a challenge in some of the respects that I've mentioned. Obviously, we all ex we accept reason, they accept reason, they accept emotions, we accept emotions, we accept uh, uh, sensory, perceptual, and imaginative capacities, so do the uh, uh, secular psychologists. So there, there's just, we're in the same uh, framework. Thank you.